Okay, hi, uh, welcome to the uh, Singapore PHP Community Combined Meetup for today. Uh, is a meetup combined of the PHP user group, the WordPress user group, the Magento user group, and the Drupal uh, user group. Uh, and we have a mix of uh, developers and non-developers today. So there are some designers, there's a product manager sitting at the back. So I'll try to make a little the talk a little bit less technical today. So I'm going to talk about how to be kind to others. Okay, uh, more specifically, I'm going to talk about designing developer-friendly JSON for API responses. Okay, so be kind to others is a short form. Uh, some introduction about myself. My name is Zion. I'm from, I'm from Singapore, so uh, that's why my website is zion.sg. You can just uh, hit it up, uh, and if you wish to contact me, you can go and catch the Tweety bird that's running about on the page. So uh, I'm a freelance developer, and uh, I'm doing a bit of uh, mobile app development at the moment as well, uh, due to the requirements for my client. So uh, now I'm trying to learn Android and iOS as well. So for the top proper, um, normally when we design UI, so user interfaces, we want it to be user friendly. Uh, we want it to, uh, to give a good user experience, a good UX. So how about API, application programming interfaces? How about API? Shouldn't it be user friendly as well? So uh, and who are the users of APIs? It's basically us developers. So um, today I'm going to focus not on the aircon being shut off. Today we are going to focus on API responses, not requests because of the robustness principle, which basically says, be conservative in what you send, be liberal in what you accept. So basically, you think of it, let's say you are a teacher, you give a piece of homework to a class of 40, it's gonna come back with you with all kinds of horrible handwriting uh, and all kinds of grammatical mistakes, but you as a teacher, you just have to accept it. You have to be linear in that. Of course, you can grade that F, lah, but that's another matter. But when you, as the teacher, you have to give them a model essay, you, the essay needs to be grammatically correct. It needs to sound nice. It needs to be done in neat handwriting. So your output to the students have to be good. They have to be straight. So there's a security mantra that says that never trust the user. We cannot control the input from other people to our API, to our server, but we can control the output from our API. So today we are focusing on responses for uh, API that we are designing. We are not focusing on requests. Um, today's a PHP meetup. Uh, when we code our API in dynamic languages like PHP or let's say JavaScript, we sometimes forget the consumers, the people who are using our API. They may be using a strongly typed language like Java or Swift. So right now, uh, I've been mostly my life a uh, PHP developer. So now I'm doing some mobile app developer. So this talk is a result of having been on both sides of the fence. Uh, just last year or two years ago, I was designing APS using PHP, using uh, uh, PSR7 and middleware. Uh, this year, just a few months back, now I'm doing uh, mobile apps, consuming people's APIs done in PHP. Now I feel the pain. So now uh, on both sides of the fence. So here's the uh, talk about it. So some lingo, some definitions first. JSON, JavaScript object uh, notation. So basically it's a lightweight data interchange format. It's just a format to uh, exchange data, very simple. So it's made of name value pairs, each pair being a property. So some websites call it key value. So today we just use the definition from json.org, we just call it name value. So in this second point, this is a JSON. It's covered with curly braces. There are two properties, a name property and an age property. In the first property, the name is name and the value is Bob. The second property, the name is age and the value is 20. Now the API consists of one or more endpoints. So basically is I have a URL. You call this URL with some parameters and then you just return you a response. Okay, I think you've made this very clear because uh, these are two endpoints. Some people, they may call it two APIs. So I need to put this up front. 
So I'm going to share with you eight points, eight suggestions. It's not dogmatic. You don't need to agree with me. Okay, so it's just some opinions on my part, having been on both sides of the fence. So first one, camel case. Camel case means a word start with a small letter and subsequent word start with a capital letter. Now, usually in PHP, uh, we will use camel case for variables. Let's say my boss. So dollar my boss is a variable. Uh, so we use a camel case. Um, so the top part is uh, sample JSON. So uh, there's two properties, first name property and the last name property. And the names are in camel case. So the second block of code, we have PHP code. We have a person class to actually model this JSON as a person. So you look at the, pro uh, you look at the properties, we have a first name, public first name and a public last name. And actually how would we reference so when we convert this JSON into a person object, so this is how we are actually uh, reference it. My boss, arrow, first name. So my boss is in camel case, first name is in camel case, everything looks consistent, looks fine. Now how about the next one? This is in snake case, uh, because uh, snake has a lot of underscores, so it's called snake case. Now the JSON, instead of camel case, just first underscore name. And then uh, look at the second block of code. To model the person, to make it life easier for us, we will use the same case convention, public first underscore name as a JSON. And this time around, how do we reference the properties? Let's say my boss is a person. And then I'll get my boss arrow first underscore name. Somehow it looks a bit inconsistent. Okay, so imagine let's say you have 1,000, few thousand lines of codes and you have a mix of camel case and uh, underscore uh, snake, case, uh, snake case properties. So something to bear in mind. Another uh, case of point for pushing for camel case for names. Now if the JSON response has a lot of properties or has a lot of elements on a very large list, eliminating underscores might save a little bandwidth Let's say, supposing uh, my pagination has 1,000 records. Uh, let's say uh, it won't happen, but let's say uh, I just trying to push the point. So uh, if, you, uh, if you eliminate 1 million underscores, uh, I think I'll save 1 million bytes. That's about 1 megabyte in my bandwidth. Uh. Just saying. <laughs> now, this first point on camel case for names is not dogmatic, as well as the remaining seven points that follow. Sometimes, for convenience sake, we may map the JSON properties to database columns or query string parameters. So like this is a table, the WP post table from WordPress. So you look at this, all the columns are underscore in snake case. So it makes sense, it makes sense for WordPress. So when I want to reference the properties in the post, I will put arrow ID, capital ID, or arrow post underscore title. So this is a use case where, okay, it's fine. You want to map it straight to your database table. The JSON is like mirror of your database table. Okay, so it's fine. Most importantly, it's consistent. You want to use camel case, use camel case all the way. You want to use snake case, use snake case all the way. Please don't have this out of case. Uh, you have a JSON where some is using camel case, some using snake case, some using Pascal case, some using kebab case. I just learned about kebab case. Uh, yeah. So why kebab? Kebab is like a satay because of the arrow, so it's like one stick going through a few pieces of meat, so kebab case. You have a caps case, <laughs> and uh, some funny case are uh, like supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, like like something from Sound of Music, right? And it's an uh, alternate uh, lowercase and capital letter. So most important part is to be consistent, okay? Don't really need to be camel case, but most importantly, to be consistent. Second point. Use now only for objects and empty values for other data types. Now in PHP, we are very fortunate, okay? Uh, I'm quite fortunate. There are three blocks of code here. First block, PHP. I can declare x to be a number, 3, x equals to 3. I can also put in the last line, x equals to now, and it will be perfectly fine. No issues. Now in Swift, the programming language for iOS, um, if you declare a variable as integer, you cannot set it as now. You cannot set a value of now to it. Unless you declare it as a type optional, the first line, int, int question mark. 
Okay, so it's called optional integer. Now int question mark and int for all uh, definitions are uh, basically two different types. Two different types. Now you may say, never mind uh, I just declare all the types as int question mark lah. No problem, right? So I can just use equals now everywhere, right? The problem is the variable y. Now variable y is an optional integer. I put equals three. I can set it to now. So the problem is when I want to use the optional integer y, I need to put an exclamation mark. Why exclamation mark? I need to unwrap it. I don't know ask me why. Okay, it's Apple who designed it. Uh, if you try to just put y plus 2, it's not allowed. The third block of code, Java. Java distinguishes between uh, primitive data types and uh, cl uh, classes. So you yeah, put int a equals to 1, integer b equals to 1, eh? no problem. Both can accept 1. But if I put int c equals now, not allowed. The compiler will throw an error. But if I put integer d, which is a class, this is a primitive data type, integer d equals now, allowed okay so when you're designing a json right uh it, it kind of matters to us right if you're consuming php as it doesn't matter lah, my variable can change any time right but for java and swift they are strongly typed it matters a lot to them causes a lot of headaches now um an ios app can be programmed in two languages objective c which is older and swift which is newer um when you're writing a framework or library or what you call SDK in Swift, then you want to pass your client this library and they are using Objective-C. So they are using a Swift framework in the Objective-C app. There are a lot of limitations. One of them is actually optional. So on top of it, I have a person class in Swift and I want to use it in Objective-C app. So you see I got the add Objective-C uh, annotations in front. Now, the last, so ID, integer equals to zero, it works. Name, string, optional, equals to now, works. Address, question mark, equals to now, works. Uh, but the last part, H, integer, question mark, equals to now, not allowed. It's not allowed. Um, because integer, question mark, cannot be exposed to Objective-C because uh, they have problems casting to NS number. The exact reasons, uh, I don't know how to explain to you, so okay, I'm still learning. So, but basically, everything, string question mark, address question mark, uh, my own class question mark, list question mark, everything can be exposed to Objective-C except for integer question mark. So this JSON over here, everything is okay. You can set everything to now. Uh, the properties are missing, everything is fine, but this will cause a lot of problem for Swift developers. Now, so what I mean by empty values for other data types? So let's just take a leaf out PHP group, uh, book. Empty string for string types, 0 for integer, 0, 0 for float, now for objects, false for booleans, uh, and array for empty list. So basically, you, use, you only use now for objects. If your property is a string property, property let's say uh, first name is a string property, then, if there's nothing, just pass an empty string in your JSON. Don't pass now. What if zero cannot be used for integers? So, some example, you can put duration equals to minus one. So, duration property, name is duration, minus one is a value to indicate infinite duration. Let's say you're doing live streaming for a video. Records per page, minus one, it could mean the, no limit on the records per page or maximum number of records. Uh, return h minus one probably h unknown etc. Okay, uh, the point. Consistent data types. So let's look at the top one. The top code block id equals to one. One that is a number. But if you look at the spouse id two, two is a string. So we are being inconsistent. Now, look at the second piece of block. Let me say again, we are very fortunate to be using PHP. I can put s equals to 1 on the next, very next line, I can put s equals to hello, and there will be no problems. No problems, we are so used to it. Okay, but in Java, no. Once you declare a variable as an integer, you set it to 1, you cannot change it into a string suddenly. They say, you always declare this, integer, uh, this variable as an integer. You cannot suddenly give me a string. Same with Swift. Okay? So if it's meant to be an integer, keep it as integer throughout all endpoints, 
all objects. Do not use integer sometimes, use string sometimes. Uh, list. If a property, this is a children property, it is a list or what you call array, keep it as an array throughout all objects uh, and across all endpoints. So here, the top code block, we have children we have, with uh, two elements, two children. Now, this second block is no. Okay? The developer is expecting a list for children. And then suddenly, because there's only one child, you change it into an object. This causes a lot of problems. They need to, look, they need to do a lot of special handling to uh, handle this special case. And if there are no children, don't put children equals to now. Put it as an empty list. Okay, fourth point. Use strings for ID. Now, using integers, using numbers for ID, say, uh, what's your ID, ID, your ID number one, ID number two. There are some limitations. The biggest is being range. The Facebook graph API, right? Facebook, they use strings for the ID. When you call the API, they return strings for the ID. Probably it's because the number of posts in Facebook already exceeded the, total, the maximum range. So currently, the maximum range we have is 2 to the power of 64. So if you're handling negative numbers, you can only handle minus 9 quintillion to 9 quintillion. If you don't need to handle negative numbers, the range is 0 to 18 quintillion. Uh, quintillion is basically 18 billion billion. Now, another thing is, supposing if you change the format in the future, now I say I want to use integers for ID. Tomorrow, I say, never mind, I want to change, I want to use my passport number, don't use a passport number, or use a UUID as, a, as my ID, right? You change to string. Very easy, right? In PHP, I just change, right? But the Java and the Swift developers, they need to rush to update the code. Rush, ready? Can they, can they push out straight away? They need to submit to the App Store for approval. How long does it take? About one or two weeks for the Apple App Store. And after that, when your Candy Crush, say, new Candy Crush version, another 1,000 levels, do you update straight away? You don't write. So the end users, those people using apps, like, always never update straight away. Some people are probably still on iOS 10. So uh, you, you think, right, for you, it's, the change is very fast. But for the people's consuming an API, especially those doing mobile apps, right, the change is very slow for them to push out. Point number five. Do not omit properties in your JSON. So here we have two examples. In the second example, Bob has no children. So I, as the API designer, say, okay, never mind. Then uh, I don't, I just leave out the whole children property. La. So the developer consuming this response, right, will have to ensure no crashes happen when your children property is suddenly omitted. Okay, sounds difficult again. Uh, Codable was in Introduced in Swift 4 last year, it's basically interface is like it allows you to do here, do this thing. You can pass the JSON string, the response to a JSON decoder and say, put this and cast into a person class. Just two lines. Previously, you do all this manually by hand. So the codable class, you just put public class person codable, implements codable, and that's it. You don't need to do any extra code. But if you omit the children property, you need to do this whole chunk of code. This whole chunk. Now, if the children property is always there, it's never omitted, I can just delete all these lines here, and you will just be these four lines. Okay? That's a lot of work to do. You may be asking, Zion, why don't you just put inter uh, children, integer, question mark equals to near? Then you'll solve all your problems, right? In this case, you put integer, question mark equals to near. If the JSON omits the children property, then it's okay. They will just put children equals to near, no problem. But remember, just now I said, integer question mark cannot be exposed to Objective-C. Okay? So don't ask me why. So in this case, don't omit properties. Point number six. Now, when we consume an API, when I'm a developer consuming a response from the API, it is common to write classes to model the responses. Okay, I write a class, uh, the class looks like the response. And I write another class that looks like the entities, the properties inside the response. This will make it very easy to 
create it into object using the decoding library instead of manually reading the JSON response and filling the properties by hand. So right now we have two sample JSON for the person endpoint and the product endpoint. Uh, person endpoint, the response we have a status, okay, ID, name, address, products, we have a status, okay, we have a list of products, records per page, and total. So let me show some example in Swift. This is how they will model the response. Just now you had person response, status, ID, name, address. Person response, status, ID, name, address. How then after that a person is basically the ID name address and the address is uh, consists of the street street and the uh, zip code. Now I cannot create a person object over here straight away because ID and name are primitive data types, just an integer and string. So I need to cast into this person response, then after that create a person from this person response. This for the person endpoint. This is for the products endpoint. Now, uh, so supposing you have a lot of code, you are always using the same code to handle a response. But eh, person response is different from products response. Right? Then how are you going to use the same code? So Swift and Java have this thing called generics. So you can actually use generics. Uh, you can skip this code here. So I can actually do this. I have a response handler. This response takes in a response and casts it into a person response. And then I'll do print out something. Okay, if I put products response, basically it's going to be the same code. It's going to print out the status of the product response. So you can use uh, different classes. Now imagine you have 100 endpoints with 100 different top level properties and endpoints over here. So it's going to be a big mess. Okay, you have to write a lot of person response, product response, merchant response, employee response, and what's, what have you. So I'm going to suggest just three top level properties across all endpoints. Data, error, and pagination. All three will be objects. So that if there's no value, you can just issue the value or now. Okay, now the first part we have a suggested error response. Error is object so that we can have the flexibility of adding other properties next time. Probably you have an internal error code, 10041, something like that. So suggested error response. Data and pagination is now. Error has a message. Suggested response for the person endpoint. So now data has something inside it. We have the ID, we have the name, we have the address. Error is now, pagination is now. Note that I omitted the status property. Just now we had a status okay, right? I omitted it. Because I feel that probably you don't, you don't feel the same way. Lah. I feel that developers should learn how to read HTTP status codes to determine if a response is successful and not depend on the API designer to say, hey, status okay, status success. Now, th the problem is this status property, right? There's no standard list of values. And it is very prone to misspelling. Some people say capital S uh, for success. Some people say okay. Some people say all right. Some people say no problem. So uh, what if I suddenly change the case and then it's going to break all the code of the person using your API? Suggest a response for product endpoint. Now, now that's pagination, records per page. Pagination should be not should not be mixed with the actual data. And you look at this data, it is still an object. Object is basically covered in curly brace. It means covering the square base is basically a list. It did not suddenly become a list of products. It, data remains an object and uh, products uh, is inside it. Okay? This is what we say just now, consistent data types. If a property is an object, it should be an object always. Don't suddenly change to an array just because you like it. Point number seven, get the second last point, don't, don't worry. Point number seven, uh, consistent naming for similar properties across endpoints. Now, they say a picture paints a thousand words. So this example should speak volumes. So here we have a sample of three types of people. 
from the employee point. ID 1, last name is Wo, age 30. Okay, no problem. So his spouse, uh, eh, no ID, uh, person ID. Eh, last name, right? Yeah, I know family name is last name. Right? Okay, okay. Uh, so instead of using age, I use years. Then let's look at the manager and point. Instead of ID, you use employee ID. Then instead of first name or last name or family name, you use surname. Uh, that's in Asian context. Okay, and instead of age or years, you use 40. So in this case, right, the API is really consistent. Usually, it's one person designing all the endpoints in the API. Usually, la, usually. So what message are you sending across? The developers consuming or response like, wow, well, well, actually, I can have a person class no, to model all these three. Employee endpoint consists of a person with a spouse, and the spouse is a person class. And the manager is a person. So all is ID, last name, and age. But now you give me this out of JSON, I need to have a person class, a spouse class, and a manager class. So it's extra code, unnecessary code. Okay, last point, number eight. Uh, use UTC time zone and ISO 8601 for timestamps. Now, just a quick question. What would the following code, this in yellow, uh, in PHP, produce when you run it at midnight on National Day? Uh, Singapore's National Day is 9th of August. 9th of August. So, uh, how many of you say number one? Hands up. How many of you say number two? Hands up. Okay, I got one. Okay, I got one hand. How many of you say number three? Yes, very good. <laughs> Okay, now, if I run it on my laptop over here, I will get number one. If I run it on my website, design.ig, I will get number two. If I run it on my previous company's server, or AWS, right, I will get number one. So the thing, it varies. <coughs> By the way, the dates will read differently if you are in US. They are using the month, month first, and day. So for answer number one, right, you can actually read 9th of August or 8th of September. It depends. You don't know. Now, so the point is always explicitly set the time zone as UTC when you create dates. Okay, do not assume. If not, the dates will default to the time zone of the server that the code is running on, which may or may not be set to UTC. Now, Supposing, let's say your sis and me is having a holiday in uh, Indonesia. Then after that, you ask him to set it up. So somehow his account is locked to Indonesia time and ends up the EC2 instance is set to Indonesia time. It may not be UTC. Now, supposing, let's say your headquarters, your office headquarters is in Singapore. And the sis and me say, I'm the one, I'm the only one who are looking through the logs every day. So, of course, I will need to be in Singapore time, right? It's easier for me to check, right, when this happened, when this happened, right? So, I set the whole server time zone to be Singapore. It makes sense. No problem. So, that means that you cannot depend on the server time zone to be always UTC. Okay? So, in this case, if I use date C, C will basically return ISO 8601, which is an unambiguous format. Year, month, day, 24 hour, uh, minute, second, and the time zone. Date C depends on your server. If I use GM date, it will always return as GMT or UTC. If I'm using date time and the date time zone, how to set it uh, UTC, we are passing a new date time zone UTC. Uh, over here, I can use format C. It will still return me ISO AC01. So in this case, this is a format. It's just that now I want the microseconds. That's why I use this special format. But this is also a valid ISO 8601 timestamp. Um, there was a case where I had a client. Uh, he was using a mobile phone. Um, now, when you use an ISO 8601 like this, with a, with a, with a time zone, as request, headers or parameters. Now I talk about requests. Huh? Request headers or parameters. It is very useful, especially when you're troubleshooting mobile devices. I had a client when um, his mobile app will always have authentication issues with the API server. Then after one big round, then we realized that, eh, 
his mobile app, right, the request time stamp is always one hour behind our API server. Exactly one hour. Not one hour, one second, one hour, 15 seconds, exactly one hour. So it turns out that the client was came from Indonesia and our server is in Singapore. So you go figure. Okay. Now, some people probably suggest, hey, just use Unix time. Right? Unix time is independent right, of time zones. It's an integer, so no problem. The main problem is it's not human readable. Never mind why. It's my application was consuming the API response. Right? So who cares whether it's human readable? OK, you will care because software engineering is 10% development, 90% maintenance. When you're fighting fire and your manager is breathing down your neck, okay, the last thing you want when you're debugging JSON for API request and response is to use a converter. Let me go to converter.com, right? Let me see this number. I copy and paste and then convert to a human readable date. That's the last thing you want to do when you're fighting fire. So yes, correct. So uh, compare this to this one, which is more easier to read. Okay, there's more bandwidth. So yes, uh, unit time is independent of time zones, but the problem is it's not human readable. That is the main point about it. Okay, let me wait for him to take, finish taking photo first. Okay, <laughs> don't worry, the slides will be online. Okay, so I share eight points. Um, so the gist of all the points is the key principle. Keep it simple and stupid. It is so simple and so stupid that you can never go wrong. The people using your API will never go wrong, and they don't need to guess anything. And the way to do that is consistency. Now, you don't need to agree with me with all the points here. You may disagree. It's totally fine. But the most importantly is you make sure your API is consistent. You want to use camera case? Use camera case throughout all your JSON responses. Don't miss like camera case, state case, web case. Okay, so when you are consistent, you save your consumers, your users, time guessing. They don't need to play guessing games, and they can make the coding lives easier. Now, uh, no question that you heard of this story. It's uh, basically the frog that lives in a well. They thought he's, uh, he only see the sky and thought his world is very big. Only when a tortoise, no, not tortoise, a turtle came by, and then he realized actually there's a much bigger world up there. Today, we saw a lot of non-PHP code. This is a PHP meetup, but we saw no, a lot of non-PHP code, like Swift and Java. So I love PHP. PHP. While we can focus on PHP, right, we should also be aware of the other languages. Okay, so be kind to others, and then work well with them, and then uh, not be like the fraud. So George Poyer, he uh, came out with a book. I forgot what's the name of the book, uh, but he was talking about system that can solve any problem in the world. So this system has four points. Understand, plan, do, and check. Understand, plan, do, and check. So supposing that like, you are a newbie, you do not know anything about programming. You only know how to check. You are the last stage check. So say, hey, this web phone got a problem. You go and fix it. Okay, then later on, probably you pick up programming. So you become a coding monkey. You become a junior developer. Then after that, you are at the do phase. Uh, Zion go fix this. Zion uh, uh, go into uh, code uh, last name uh, field on the form. OK, do, do, do. Coding monkey, then you paid peanuts. Then after that, uh, you become a team lead, okay, a senior developer. Then uh, you get a plan. Oh, OK, you want me to do a web form, right? So web form should have first name, last name, mobile uh, phone, and address. So uh, but probably you might still be a coding monkey, but probably now they pay you bananas. Okay? But the last part is when you go even higher to the higher stage, understand. Okay? That's where probably our software, uh, software architect is telling, what is the purpose of the form? Is it for contact? Is it for payment? Understand. It is only when you have a bird's eye view. Okay? If you're always focusing on this small little point, like, okay, I do my own PHP and then that's it. I don't care about the other people, right? Then you will end up in a well. But you, when you have a bird's eye view, you know what the other uh, what's the programming landscape out there, right? You are able to come to the point of understand. So the point is, we should not like remain as coding monkeys or just remain uh, 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 contented at this phase. We should rise up, okay, and make our co code a beautiful piece of functional art, okay, to rise up to, to be a software craftsman. So this is my talk today. Uh, on making your API developer friendly. That's all. Thank you.